G'day, g'day, and welcome to Pints with Aquinas. Matt Frad here. Today we've got Jonathan Paggio on the show. Do us a favor, click that thumbs up button. Um, I don't know if the thumbs down button still works. If you don't like it, you're welcome to click that too. But if you enjoy this conversation and you think it's worth other people hearing, it would be huge if you could share this video on Facebook. That, that would be the best way to kind of help spread this. Jonathan, what's up? Nice to see you. Yeah, it's good to see you again. Now, I forget, where are you in Canada and what's it like there right now? <laughs> <laughs> I am in uh, Quebec, so it's French speaking Canada. We just had our first like snow that seems like it's going to stay there for a while. And so it's nice and cold. Um, and we're just watching the we're just watching what's going to happen with this COVID pass and the lockdowns and this new variant and what that means. And, you know, them trying to uh, vaccinate our uh, children like that's the next thing right now that's going to start in January, uh, the five to 12 year olds. And so that's what we're just we're just watching and praying is the best thing to do, I guess. Yeah, people keep coming up to me and saying, like, it's crazy what's going on in Australia. And I haven't really been following it. And so I'm not sure if they're just hearing the worst case scenarios or if it really is that bad. But man, this is such a stressful time. You, you, know, you think like if you had a forest fire going on by you or if there was some sort of hurricane or something, there's a clear ending point where we can all just sort of go, ah. But with this, I get the feeling that there's no ending point. I mean, how are you kind of dealing with it? I mean, I think we're just finding strength in our family and strength in our community and um, trying not to get at least, you know, to just to just play it one day at a time. There isn't much you can do if I mean, some people are becoming more. I know some people that are leaving, let's say, going to the US, going, finding <laughs> places where things are less severe. But um, I guess it depends also on, on the way you see things. For us, we're just we're just trying to. I've been trying to be more involved in my local community, local parish, and uh, just, just, yeah, just being with my family and praying, and yeah, that's uh, that for me at least for now. That's been the the way that I've been dealing with it. Yeah, me too. And I've actually kind of gotten to the point where I pretty much have sworn off air travel <laughs> for good. I just sense this spirit of hostility in the air when I travel. I I don't know if that's just my indigestion or something, or if it's actually like in touch with something real. But it just it just feels very oppressive. Air travel is awful enough as it is with going through security and things like that. And having to wear a mask, I'm just, I just, I'm kind of done. So I, I find I'm turning down speaking engagements. I'm trying to stay home as much as I can, or if I have to go somewhere, hoping to drive and things like that. But yeah, it might be good. Might We might end up living a more human life by, by being closer to the communities that we love. Well, we hope but. so. We hope that that'll be the fruit, at least in our own lives of what's going on. So. Yeah. Um, so what's going on with you? I, I saw that you just released or you're in the process of releasing a graphic novel. I've got a link in the description <laughs> below if people are interested. It looks really cool. Yeah, we so my brother and I, um, we wrote a story 10 years ago. It was uh, actually written as a movie, but we, we got some interest. We were able to have it uh, scouted and we had some Hollywood studios request the um, the screenplay, but we were very naive about how a movie's made at the time, and there was yeah. no way this was going to be made as a movie. Um, and uh, and so it took a while for us to kind of find the, the the resources and the people to do it. But we have an artist now, and so we're putting it out as a series of graphic novels. And the oh. idea is, we're taking basically a good way to think of it is we're taking all the weird stuff in the Christian tradition and just jamming it into one <laughs> story. And so taking all amazing. the weird stuff, nice. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the main character is uh, St. Christopher, who many people don't know is yeah. a uh, is secretly a dog headed man. And so the oldest traditions of St. Christopher was that he was a cenocephaly. And so a wow. kind of dog headed man from the edge of the world. And so we kind of take and there's all these encounters of early, for example, in the legends of, uh, of, uh, of St. Andrew, where he encounters these dog headed people. And you see it in the legends of Alexander the Great and all these medieval legends. And so we kind of fuse that all into one kind of character of this wild kind of dog headed creature that encounters hmm. a group of pilgrims going to uh, Jerusalem. And in that group of pilgrims is St. George, the dragon slayer, uh, St. Mercurius, whose legend also has dog headed people in it. So it really is this it, it, it is like an adventure story, you know, yeah. an adventure story in the show. world of the scripture, really, like is the best way to understand it, the world of, of Christian traditions. And and uh, so there's. You know, you have all these biblical characters, Adam and Eve. We have um, a visit. It starts like with this kind of retelling of Genesis account, uh, but in a, in a kind of adventure, legendary way. 
Um, and it moves, oh. it slowly moves towards like a more and more epic, epic story of a, of a giant conflict between, you know, the Nephilim and the Byzantine hmm. Empire, basically. And so it's like, yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's really a, it's an adventurous story. So we hope I'm, people I'm, are going to, to support us. Yeah, I'm showing people, I don't know if you can see that on your screen, but I'm showing people what it looks like. Who, who did the, did you draw the, the drawings and the coloring? So it's an artist, his name is Cord Nielsen. Um, okay. Someone that I discovered a few years ago, who uh, who's just been doing some great work. You know, very, wow. very kind of nice, simple uh, style of artwork. Like people know a little bit about comic books. He's kind of like Jeff Smith or uh, like a Hellboy type comics with that that kind of simple style with a really bold coloring. And so, yeah, it's a, it's it's the first it's the first of a, of a series, and we're really excited because we've. We've reached already about what is it like almost one hundred and thirty-six, uh, yeah, yeah, thirty-six thousand uh, and two thousand wow. something backers. So it's it's pretty cool. There's still a few weeks left, so people can get in on it. Yeah, I got a link in the description if people want to support this. So um, yeah, I guess this is a, this is expensive stuff, huh? It's like we take things for granted. We see graphic novels in the store and stuff like that, and just expect people just crap these things out, and it doesn't take money, but it obviously does. Yeah. And so we're hoping like that one of the reasons why we're doing it also as a crowdfunding is we're hoping to get enough funds to be able to finance the second book directly, you know, and not hmm. have to wait and not have yeah. to to to, uh, to rely on volunteer work and stuff like we did this time. So so have your have your brother and yourself been involved in writing things like this for, for quite a while then? Well, a long time ago, I used to write plays. This was like in another life in a certain manner. I, I wrote several plays that were produced here in Quebec and were that toured and everything. Um, and then, you know, my life took on different turns. And uh, and so this is in a way I haven't done it. I, I I'd stopped writing for a little while in terms of fiction. But this uh, this is uh, just diving back into the world of fiction. But my brother is a writer. He wrote a book called The Language of Creation, which is about biblical symbolism. And I obviously write, you know, on different articles for different publications and stuff. That's really cool. Do, do you know that I kind of write fiction as well? Really? I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. It, this isn't about me, but I'll just say it quickly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah like my sister know. my sister and I write short horror stories. Um, and then we have a podcast called Sibling Horror. And then we pay a, uh, a fellow, an American fellow to, to narrate them. Uh, so it's it's just very clean. There's no intro or outro. It's very minimalist. There's no pitches for Patreon or anything like that. It's just straight into the story. Um, and we have kind of always enjoyed the when I when I talk about horror, I, I guess I'm talking about sort of supernatural suspense fiction. Mm -hmm. um, interesting. Yeah. But I think there's an interesting moment right now. It's there's I think there's an exciting moment because one of the things, for example, that's interesting about Tolkien is that. Tolkien wrote what is possibly one of the most Christian stories in the modern world, but it doesn't refer at all to the Christian mm. world, right? It's basically in a fantastical world based on uh, northern mythological patterns. But the the structure, the basic structure and the moral structure and everything is very Christian. But mm. I think that there's an exciting time right now. We started writing this back in 2005, 2007 is when we started thinking about it. And it was at the time when there were all these weird movies about um, using Christian, a kind of Christian mythological world, but in a subversive way. There's a movie called Stigmata. Then there was Constantine. Mm. Uh, and then the Da Vinci Code came out. So there was all this strange desire to actually use all these, all this imagery that, that uh, especially the Christian Middle Ages developed, but then use it upside down in a way to show how, like to, to twist Christianity into weird directions. And so mm. one of the things we wanted to do is to basically do the opposite which is, okay, we can do that too. Let's take all the weird stuff from Christianity that you think is funny, and we're gonna put it in a strange story that is ultimately going to turn back towards a kind of more classic storytelling uh, and ultimately a story about redemption you know, in the end. And so that's, the, that's kind of the basic idea. And I think that in a way right now is interesting because people don't know about these stories, but we've forgotten our own stories. And so to say something like St. Christopher, the dog headed giant, it's like, whoa, it's, it's as much a surprise as any kind it of It was to me, story yeah. You could tell, yeah. So that's the idea. So we have St. Simeon, the stylite in the story, who's just a monk who lives on a 60 foot pole as this kind of mysterious hermit figure that's in the background. You know, it happens in these uh, cave monasteries that look like the ones you see in Turkey. So it's like taking all this Christian imagery and putting it back into a story that will in a way, it's our own story, but we don't know it. And so it's bringing a, a sense of wonder back to uh, to Christian storytelling. How, how important, I mean, we live also in a very materialistic 
uh, society. And um, I wonder if people hear about what you're talking about, like St. Christopher, the dog-headed giant or whatever, and just be like, dude, all this does is make fun of Christianity. Like a lot of people, a lot of friends of mine, they think Christianity is bunk anyway. And here you are doing a book about some dog-headed monster. Aren't you just sort of giving them more fuel for the for the fire? Well, I think that in, in a way, there's something of a trick being played on people because as we're moving, as the world is being re-enchanted, this is the sense that we have more and more is that a, a lot of this materialism and a lot of this kind of uh, scientism is dying. It's going away. It's losing the battle. The new atheists basically have lost right now, even in terms of attention, you can see them devolving into all this kind of weird politically correct stuff and they don't they don't know where to hold anymore. And so... Oof. <laughs> yeah, that's Good true. That's so, a great yeah, so point. Yeah. One of the things we want to present people is a different way of understanding reality, which is more story based and is more based on our experience of the world. Um, mm -hmm. And if you watch my videos, you know, I'll do that where I'm trying to if you understand the world phenomenologically, that is like from the perspective of this experience that we have of the world, then a lot of the old stories that are weird will start to make mm. sense again. So, for example, the idea of the dog headed man, you know, it's interesting to notice, for example, that um, let's say Alexander encounters a dog-headed man in Asia, and then Charlemagne talks about the dog-headed man coming from the north, and then Christopher Columbus actually encounters dog-headed men on the first day that he arrives in in uh, in uh, in America, mm -hmm. and so it's like, what's going on? And so basically, you need to understand it as just the experience of the strange, I love that it's it. the experience of something that you don't understand experience of mm. something that doesn't have an identity for you and then you can start to understand what monsters are in general you know there really is just let's say something that doesn't have a clear category presenting itself to you and so it appears as hybrid as monstrous as too much of this too little of that and so so the idea is to kind of pull people into these stories and then ultimately also like if people read the graphic novel and then watch my videos we'll see that you don't necessarily need to posit a genetic uh, existence of a genetic being that is somehow uh, like genetically a dog and a man to have the idea of the dog headed man rather for the same reason that a, like a, a hippopotamus doesn't have to be genetically related to a horse right? it's a river horse but it doesn't have to be physically a horse it's like it's a category of a human engagement you could say um, and so we so we dive into the idea basically of the monstrous and the stranger and the idea of things that don't fit and how we can integrate them into the world and how, so, how its potential and its danger. So that's basically, let's say, the underlying philosophical idea of the, of the story. Of course, we don't explicitly say any of that. It's all, mm. it's all storytelling. You know, it's character and character arcs and adventure. But underlying that, it's really how to deal with this. And it's, it has, it's really speaking to the situation we're in now, which is this weird world where the exception is the rule, the real, this weird world where, you know, things that have unclear identities are starting to appear more and more on our horizon and imposing themselves as a question like, okay, what do you do with this? Um, and how is it that we can exist in that and how we can answer that? So, so that's really the, basically the dog headed men, that's what they end up being about really. I love that. I, I just had a big interview with a friend, Sean Fitzpatrick, on the show. We talked about fairy tales and things like that. And, and being an Orthodox Christian and into fairy tales, you're probably aware of the Russian fairy tales. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there, there's the stuff in the Russian fairy tales is just amazing. It's, to, I mean, not to, to, talk it down to, like our fairy tales. Well, well the Brother Grimm's are pretty bloody. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, but, but, um, talk about not having a category. The, uh, you, you, you can explain this better than me, but that, that idea where you encounter a hut with chicken legs and demand that it turn to face you. Like, what the hell is that? <laughs> Yeah, that's exactly. Baba Yaga is a great example mm -hmm. of, let's say, the strange woman in the forest or the 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 odd the oddness in this forest. But we have that like in many, many uh, stories. For example, Hansel and Gretel is a great example Whew, where it's terrifying. You know, yeah. You, yeah. Where you move into the, the strange world and then you encounter something which seems impossible to you. And so that let's say that encounter offers opportunity. Right, it offers opportunity. It it, it, it can actually seduce you, um, and so it offers both opportunity, but you have to be careful because that opportunity is always fraught with danger. So the idea of like going out into the strange world and finding treasures, finding dragons that guard treasures, all has to do with that, which is that something which has no category yet is is an opportunity, um, and for increase in in identification, because they're increase in power. 
So, but it's also something that can devour you. Like a good way, a good simple way of understanding it would be, imagine the Roman Empire. And so as it wants to expand, what it does is that it actually will hire mercenaries from all these tribes around them. So they'll hire all these mercenaries that don't fit into their world, really. They're, mm -hmm. they're kind of wild cards. And so as you do that, you increase your power. You become more and more powerful. But if you do it too much, at some point, they'll swallow you. Like at some point, you know, the, the outside will swallow the inside. And so that's really the, let's say, the opportunity and danger of strangeness. Um, and so, but if you're smart, let's say, like, uh, if you're, if, like Hansel and Gretel, if you're smart, then you can turn the tables back, you know, and bring back a treasure to your family. But it's not an easy, it's not an easy thing to, uh, not always an easy thing to do. I, I, that's, that's so beautifully put. And you do such a good job at sort of maybe dissecting to materialist of a word, but, you know, like helping us understand what's going on in fairy tales. But I, but I imagine that a, fair, a good fairy tale isn't written by trying to first understand the sort of things you're talking about and then layering a story on top. Uh, you correct no, me if I'm wrong. No, not at all. No, yeah, so, so, uh, yeah, tell me. And fairy tales aren't written. They are, they kind of like emerge out of, out of <laughs> society, right? There. It's not like we yeah. know who wrote these old stories. They just, yeah. they just almost appear at, through uh, almost almost like a natural selection process where you have stories that are remembered and then told again and remembered and told again. And so they refine themselves and they move towards these very powerful uh, fairy tales that we see. And in a way, in a normal world, in a normal world, you wouldn't have to explain these stories. Mm -hmm. They would just embody your reality. Like they would just be almost like a kind of um, a, a pattern detection and pattern... Um, orienting that you would see in these stories but because we live in this materialist world and we've lost a lot of it then we find ourselves having to explain the stories um but I, but like you said explaining it is not the true it's not the the most rea the best reality of it like explaining a ritual or explaining the eucharist or explaining you know the things we engage in is actually it's it's not as good as participating it's not as powerful it's actually it can trick us into thinking we know what's going on uh, mm. and so when we explain like when i explain symbolism i know that in one way it's almost like a crutch that i'm giving people right it's like i'm trying to jump start a, uh, an engine so that people can kind of get it a little bit enough to to move in enough to go mm -hmm. to church you could say but then yeah, going be, to church is the ultimate, is the purpose, right? Not, not, the, not the explaining. Yeah, it would be like uh, mistaking the wild, dangerous world for the map we're looking at, and you're inviting them to put down the map and enter the forest or something like that. Yeah. I'm just saying, okay, look in this direction. It's, you know what the, the old people, these, you know what the, 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 let's say the boomer generation told you was stupid and superstitious and ridiculous and was completely arbitrary? Well, it's not. It's actually extremely coherent, extremely powerful, and it actually underlies your your experience of the world. So it's like at least now, now, now that you get it, now we hope that you're going yeah. to dive in rather than just continue to think about it. Now, I haven't listened to this podcast you did recently with Dr. Jordan Peterson and uh, Bishop uh, Barron and another fellow from Toronto University, John Verveke. Uh, yeah, he's a cogsci professor at, uh, at okay. the University of Toronto. Okay, and it was it was titled you know the Four Horsemen of Meaning, which I thought was cool. But uh, what was that conversation like? It was great. It was really wonderful. In a way, the conversation was meant to be myself, Jordan Peterson, and John Verveke at the outset, because hmm. we've been like the three of us have been kind of coming at it a little bit into different directions, talking about new ways of explaining religious experience, you could say, or the religious world, uh, religious tropes for modern people to understand using Cogsci as a, for John Verveke, like he's using, he's realizing the true, uh, like these new versions of cognitive science that they don't look at all like the materialism that was presented to us just a decade ago. It's completely, it's, it's very different. And it, 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 it's about embodiment and about participation mm -hmm. and about, you know, uh, this relationship between subject and object that isn't just a one way street. It's like, he calls it transjective relationship between different things. So it, it, so it was really to kind of continue that conversations uh, together. But then uh, I don't know exactly who suggested, but someone decided to, to kind of pop, uh, drop Bishop Barron into the conversation. And it was interesting because people who watch the video can't see it, but I was seeing the mosaic of everybody. And at first I thought, I don't know if Bishop Barron has heard this type of conversation before. So I was watching him and at first he said something. I mean, he's, he's an extremely intelligent 
and uh, insightful person. He was saying things. And then at some point I saw in his eyes that he really was like, oh, clicked. This huh? is what's going on. Like, this is what's happening. And then like, he became very, he became more like kind of avid and present and, uh, and curious about understanding what was happening. Um, so, so but it, cool, it ended man. up being a very good, a very good conversation. Yeah. 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 I can't. I'm gonna. I, I, I'm gonna watch it or listen to it, and I'm gonna put the link in the description below. People can look it up, of course. But yeah, that's that's really terrific. But I'd we're really kind of pushing you... people. Like we're really pushing people. Like, yeah. like I had. I took John Verveke, who's an. He's not a Christian. He's not a. He's a. He's a non-religious person who finds religion interesting. Let's say. Mm -hmm. And I had him on my channel after this conversation, just him and I. And I'm. I'm at. Sadly, the conversation ended after a certain time. But we're. I'm right on the verge of of having him admit that angels exist like that they have to exist scientifically like in terms of cognitive science and in terms of the way that people are starting to notice how qualities are necessary and let's say consciousness is necessary for the world to exist huh. that it's like if it why would it end at us it's just a yeah. silly idea that it would end at us like it scales up and you can a actually ladder of being huh? of it. yeah exactly and so it's it's so it's a uh, it's an interesting time. I find it very exciting. Very cool. How's I mean? How's Jordan Peterson doing with all this? I, I kind of feel bad for him because I feel like Christians are going to just use him as a mascot, you know. And, and every time he says anything favorable to Christianity, there's like a billion little videos saying, "See, see." Uh, it must be kind of difficult to like genuinely discern the truthfulness of these things when you know the whole world sort of sort of watching you and almost is just wants to kind of use you. To kind of boost their team up, but that's how it feels sometimes. But how's he doing with this whole Christian? Yeah, I, I would say, I would say, it, at least for that, I would say you don't have to worry about Jordan Peterson. You, you mostly have to worry about his health, let's say, because his health keeps kind of dipping and Bless coming him. back. But in terms of being used by people, I think he's quite, a, he's quite uh, akin to that. He's really, let's say, keen on what's going on, and I don't think that that uh, he'll he'll just continue to do what he does, and he'll Good be for fine him. in that in that sense. Yeah. Yeah, no, it, it, you must kind of get to a point like I, even me and my little small platform, like I've grown numb to the slings and arrows that are thrown my way. You know, you just initially it kind of you, it kind of sh rattles you, but then you just don't sort of hear it or pay attention yeah, to it. Or, like, uh, we just need to, to I mean, I mean, we need to be attentive to our own faithfulness to God and to our own faithfulness to you amen, know, the, yeah. the communities we're involved in. And uh, and then the rest, you know, whatever people don't people don't. People also are always trying to guess people's intentions and yeah. like, trying to discern, you know, why you're why people are doing things. And, you know, it, that's really they that's really I mean, sometimes we do like I mean, I like so I have to watch myself and think, OK, am I doing this just for attention? Am I doing this just to see my channel grow? Am I doing so? That's my moral question that I need to ask myself and I need to be attentive yep. to and, and need to confess to when I when I go a little bit off off key. But. You know, people writing YouTube comments. I mean, like at yeah. some point, it's like especially when they're anonymous and there are these like weird avatars and they're telling you, yeah. they're criticizing you. At least have a name, you know, it, that will help yeah. to me to pay attention to. But if it's just these, at some point, it's I, I, it's better to just let them float over your head. I think. I, I have a question for you, and I'm really interested yeah. in your answer. Why is atheism false? Well, because the world is the world meaning is inevitable meaning meaning is inevitable for the world to exist and i think that that's the exciting thing that's happening now or that people are realizing that um your very perception is purpose oriented that the way that you engage the way that you perceive reality is is always based on meaning Right. And so this is something but, that Cogsci is coming to, like a lot of Cogsci. Just, just realize. a quick clarifying question. Why, why isn't that meaning just subjective? I look upon the world. I perceive it in a certain way. I come up with a narrative for why I exist and why things exist. And it's basically coherent. But God doesn't have to exist in that, does he? Well, I, I would say that at first people might think that. But the subjective part is problematic in the atheist uh, thinking. Like what is this subjective thing that you're talking about? Like if mm. you are the pro if you are the result of a of a process of of, of evolution and of uh, natural selection, then where does this subjective thing come from? Doesn't make any sense, right? It's like you're like this weird exception in evolution that has a the capacity to be 
idiosyncratic and subjective, it, it, it completely it completely breaks apart. Even if you take the atheist kind of scientific, um, um, let's say, um, evolutionary way of thinking seriously, then the notion of of the subjective or of projecting a story onto the world completely breaks down because you are the result of patterns of the world. Your subjective experience is based on these patterns. And so whatever story you project on the world cannot be arbitrary. It must necessarily come from the very processes that also created everything else. And so, so the idea is like, this is what's going on. Let's say in, in, as it's a trick, it's, it's a fun, it's a, it's a wonderful, wondrous trick, right? Which is that when Christ died, you know, death thought it had won. They, they said, we've got the Logos, we've got the Son of God, and we're bringing him down into death. Finally, we've succeeded. And it was a trick. Because when the light was pulled into the darkness, it's the darkness that faltered. It wasn't the light. And so we're seeing the same thing happen now, which is that all the scientists pretended, let me just finish, all the scientists pretended that there was this objective world. And we were these weird disincarnate beings that could subjectively look at the world and interpret it. And then at some point they realize, well, there's something about that that's weird. We need to be able now to analyze with our materialist scientific means this mm. conscious thing, this subject thing. We need to turn back the light and then we need to bring that into materialism because it's that it's a last remaining strain of, of let's say, uh, of, uh, of religious thinking or whatever. So they turn back and they started to look at consciousness and to look at uh, the subject and the measurer. And then things started getting completely loopy. And in trying to pull consciousness down into the material mm -hmm. world, they ended up doing the opposite of what they wanted to do, which is all of a sudden, you, there is no arbitrary. There can't be. And so the, the, the consciousness now becomes a part of the system. And if it becomes a part of the system, and if meaning becomes a part of the system, then the idea that things are meaninglessness are, is ridiculous. It's a ridiculous idea. Meaning is part, meaning exists, right? Our humans engage the world with meaning. So, so t explain it to me. Don't, don't discount it. How can you discount it? You're supposed to be a scientist. You're supposed to be, you're supposed to objectively analyze the world. So now analyze the world of meaning objectively, instead of saying it's just, every time someone uses the words just, you can't have that in, especially in a completely materialist system, you can't have just. I don't know if that makes sense. So it, it's a weird flip. It's like a turn. And then I, I, things... well, I want to ask you about like when you say things became loopy, when we began to look at the subject, at the consciousness, can, can you give examples of that or explain what you mean? All right. So when we start to look at the subject or let's say the one that gives identities or the one that recognizes identities, we realize that those identities are not are not obvious in the material itself. And so this is something I talk about all the time with the problem of complexity, which is that things are made of parts and those parts are made of parts. And the notion that those parts scale up and become one mm. is not something which is obvious, right? What mm. the difference between, what's the difference between a crowd and a group? <laughs> and what's the difference between a bunch of things on a table and a glass, mm. right? Or some, or, or what's the difference between, um, so what's the difference between things that are next to each other but aren't joined together and things that are together right and yeah. so that is something which all of a sudden they can't account for in a strictly materialist world but they realize that it's part of the way that consciousness engages with reality and so then they, they so then they have to use weird terms like emergence it's like I, it's david bentley hart had a great uh, way of describing that he said when a, an atheist or a materialist uses the word emergence they just it's just magic they're just saying magic happens here and then <laughs> then then all of a sudden this this like this multiplicity becomes one through magic basically is what they're saying but that's when all of a sudden you realize that intelligence right the way that the ancient thought about it is a necessary part of reality because just for the fact of things moving from multiplicity into one while maintaining their multiplicity so I look mm. at a car, the mm -hmm. car is one thing, but it's a million things. It's a millions and millions of things. And so I'm able to, at the, at, on the one hand, I'm able to see one and I'm able to see multiple at the same time. 
And that's actually how the world unfold. Without that, you have a quant you have chaos. You have a quantum field. You have tohu bohu in the in the Genesis one. You have emptiness and void without intelligence. And so and so if this is something that even like atheist materialists are struggling to keep their to keep if they understand the problem the problem with a lot of atheists and materialists is that they don't even understand the problem they're so blind to that to, to to this situation that they just take it for granted they take identities for granted right they they think that a dog is a is is an is a is an obvious identity and they think that separating dogs between species that somehow that's obvious it's like no it's not obvious it's not obvious without intelligence it's you need intelligence to be able to how can you have a category like dog and then a category so what it, like mammal and then a category like animal? Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, thank you. And and forgive me if my questions are, are, are a little slow, if I'm not kind no, of no, catching, no, up, no, catching up with you. But um, why not just sort of uh, prefer n a sort of nominalism where you say, well, uh, phenomenologically, this cup, which is made of millions of things, and I perceive to be one, and so call it a cup. And these, this is just language uh, that I use to There's identify again, the way things look at me. Okay, right, but, but so you've one. said that just because I say just. Yeah, but what uh, I mean okay, is that if you want to encompass everything in your system, this is the, this is the end of materialism and scientism. But if you want to encompass everything into your system, you also have to encompass language into your system. You can't pretend that language is something that drops a, ah. drops down from heaven. Language also has to be part of the system that you're dealing with. So the mechanism by which language manifests itself also have to be accounted for in science. You can't drop. You can't pretend like it's just something that you can't. You don't want to include. That stands so outside like, of the exactly. thing you're examining. Yeah. Okay. And so the the sin of wanting to encompass everything in their system is what is causing it to basically collapse and reestablish reestablish an ancient an ancient way of thinking people use terms huh. like the revenge of aristotle or the revenge yes. of plato yes. because it's like you're trying to do trying to contain it all and then it actually it actually collapses and the analogy to christ going into hades is i think is very appropriate in this in this sense it, because it it's like a trying to contain god let's say in death is what it just so the same like the same with religion so, so one of the things that a lot of the atheists have used is saying religion is just silly, arbitrary, epiphenomenal, and everything. And you're like, okay, okay, well then explain it. You're a scientist, right? Explain religion. It has to have a. It have to be. You have to be able to explain it in the same way that you're explaining why certain animals eat certain things or why certain things uh, act the way they do. You you can't just pretend like it's something that 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 doesn't exist of course well, i don't think exists. they i don't i don't think they do that though I, I do think they try to give an explanation of religion but usually I, the the best explanations are the ones that actually try to show their function like the, yeah. the explanation of saying something like religion is just uh it's just sure. a silly misunderstanding of the ancient world is like well that doesn't hold something that's just a silly misunderstanding of the ancient world wouldn't last for thousands and thousands of years that even in terms of evolutionary thinking it has to have a it has to have some kind of a function that you can discern and so as they start to explore that function then again they realize that they're participating in religion all the time like you see this in the work of Jonathan Haidt especially where Jonathan Haidt is realizing how you know all organizations are, have some form of religious structure. That is, they need to identify a, a virtue or something that they, that they join themselves under, that they unite this, themselves under, and they have to process around it somehow. They have to celebrate it somehow. They have to have um, icons of it, right? Ways to recognize it, ways to represent it and so that they can celebrate it. Um, and so it's actually bringing, and by doing this, it's actually helping us understand what 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 these all these ancient ways of being are for and that they're that they're not only are they are they good but they're actually inevitable and that everybody does it whether mm -hmm. they want it or not so if you if everybody participates in these types of things whether they want to or not how about if we have one which is how about if we have the one that is aimed towards the highest good rather than secondary goods and then we're right back into Aquinas, we're right back into the medieval thinkers. If we say that, hmm. it's like if, if let's say if um if a if a if a sports team right is religious because it 
It has a name, it has a purpose, it has colors, it has a way to celebrate its identity and the celebration of the identity participates in the, the success of its goal, right? So you have a crowd cheering on the team and so the team has a better chance of winning because they're being cheered on and so you wear the colors, you have your little rituals, everything to, to mm -hmm. win the game. If that is real and that works and it does what it does, you know, maybe there are higher versions of that, you know, <laughs> that, that aren't about winning a stupid trophy. Like maybe mm -hmm. there are versions that bring you into higher states of existence. Um, so so I th that's what I think. And that, that, like that ultimately that. ends up pointing you back to. So I did a talk, for example, called um, uh, Sacred Space in Secular Terms, where I explain how sacred space works, just very just basic sa secular language. Right. You have something higher up. You have a church steeple. Everybody looks towards it. It's a place where everybody congregates and celebrates the same thing at the same time. You know, we all we all we sing together. We act together. We we, we walk together. And this binds the community together. It's completely coherent, like a, a church in a church village is completely coherent. So if it's completely coherent, maybe it's not also not arbitrary. It's pointing to, mm. to a reality that it's that it's manifesting, you know. Mm, yeah, that's really good. Thanks for, man. <laughs> Hope that makes sense. Lot. Sorry if I'm breaking your brain here. No, no, yeah, no, you're not. No, it, it 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 does make sense. I can't help but think of the atheist tropes in response to these things, but I don't want to have to keep keep beating that. Um, yeah. I go ahead. It, let, go ahead and 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 challenge me with an atheist trope and see what happens. Uh, <laughs> 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 All right. Um, uh, man finds himself in a chaotic world in which which he doesn't understand and which he'd like to order in order to remain safe and in order to flourish and so in much the same way that 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 machine at an optometrist's office makes things clearer or blurrier he finds a narrative which for the most part or at least as far as he can see it sort of fits things nicely together in a way that feels ordered so that he can gain mastery over the chaos to some extent, as far as he can see, uh, and that also makes sense of it as far as he can see. And that this is a perfectly understandable thing for a creature that has evolved to, to, uh, to, to grow into and to, a way to use religion to make sense. I mean, that just seems like a, a naturalistic explanation of religion, that these are overarching narratives that so, no one's saying are meaningless, you know, like they're, they're meaningful in the sense that they help us to prosper. And yeah, feel free to, to steal man no, that if you'd like to. No, but the answer is yes. Why not? Of course. Okay, so, so what I'm saying then is that can exist and God cannot. Well, that's the thing is that if it if it works, then it's it has a certain amount of truth to it. it has um, to. Yeah, sure, it has a sort of functional truth, but it, and you it but say it doesn't. That it's revealing a pattern, which is true, just in terms of pattern. Yep, right? it's revealing a pattern which is true. Let's use a better word. It's revealing a pattern which is good. Right, let's use that. I don't know if I want to agree with true or good. I would just say it's revealing a pattern that works. But if it works to a certain extent, it has to be revealing some kind of a of a good. Like if I if I have a if I have an apple and I have a pattern where I try to put the apple in my nose and it and it, it doesn't work, but if I put an apple in my mouth and it works, and it's like I'm revealing the good of the apple when I when I'm engaging in the proper pattern about the around the apple. And so you could say that this is something which scales up all the way into hmm. so you could see it bottom so the scientist wants to see it bottom up right mm -hmm. and and you're like yeah that's fine all bottom up bottom up that's fine I'll, I'll go with you i'll follow your game we'll go all the way uh, bottom up until we realize that without these these overarching narratives and without these patterns of behavior society crumbles or gets taken over by other other groups and you're like, mm -hmm. okay, well, that's pretty real. Like, that's a real thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That then once you reach there, you can say the reason why it, it works is because it's also top down. It's also revealing the pattern of reality back down into the world. And so that, that's what I mean. So we mm -hmm. as Christians, okay. we say it's a revelation of God. 
And the scientists will say, no, that's silly, that's stupid. It's like, okay, fine. I'll follow you bottom up until you realize that without them, society does go into chaos. Society does start to rep stop reproducing. You actually do create infertility. That you scientists, now that you've broken those patterns, you've created an infertile world that is obsessed with idiosyncrasy, that is full of people falling into addictions, that is full of uh, mm. social fragmentation, that is full of social conflict at the lowest scale possible. And so it's like, okay, maybe there was something about these things that were that was real that was mm -hmm. actually that were, re that were re that, revelatory that were prophetic that, yeah that were revelatory of of the good in in a in a real way and so it takes a lot a lot of a lot of the materials that i encounter they struggle to get to the to get to the point where you were like if it's bottom up all the way then it's also top down it, it also works top down and that's a uh, yeah. way of describing it is is coherent it's not a it's not a it's not superstitious for sure right it's it's a it's a revel and especially the way we experience it like when you when you experience a good like especially when you intuit a good your experience of that is not something it's something that you feel like a revelation like you feel like it's coming from yeah. outside of you even in a small way you know like when you're writing a story and then all of a sudden it clicks like you if you're attentive to yourself you'll notice that you don't think that comes just from you, that you're mm. somehow tapping into something which is coming back down on you, you could say, right? That is kind of, that is a little revelation, not obviously not like a like a prophet or anything, but like a little thing. Um, and so that experience, you can't, so if a, if, a, if a materialist will say, well, that's just an illusion. It's like an illusion of what? What, what is it again? What is the just again? Like if every single culture in the world has these intuitions about and it manifests itself that way then what does it mean to say it's an illusion like what is it even what are you referring to <laughs> um, that makes sense i'm sorry if i no these are great conversations and these are conversations yeah. that should be had over a pint of beer and a cigar so that we could yeah, each too sort early. Of <laughs> think and th think them through you know when you say that scientists try to understand them bottom yeah. up i'm not i i guess I, i'm not sure what you mean because when I think of materialists, they tend to try to break things down to the lowest common denominator. I remember yeah. somebody saying to me, and forgive me if this is a, a crass example, I, I, I don't think it is, but she said, why are men so attracted to breasts? They're just bags of fat. Yeah. <laughs> but that kind of thing, right? Where you reduce everything to the material. Pornography yeah. does that, right? It reduces whatever this person is and is capable of to a sort of two-dimensional thing for my consumption. And right. science, in a way, does that in order to look at the parts and understand them. So but I say bottom up. Is, this, is that kind of what you mean? So you get down to the lowest thing, like quarks or whatever. So you could say whatever. something like a good way to understand it would be that, okay, um, so let's say, let's say why are men attracted to, attracted to breasts? Like it's they're just bags of fat. And you could say, okay, um, does it make, does it, like, let's say, could you explain it, even in terms of just basic evolutionary biology, could you explain more why men are attracted to, let's say, breasts than attracted to... Um, elbows. Yeah, to antlers, <laughs> exactly. Or to something well, elbows, completely yeah. random, right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Random. You can say, well, first of all, it's part of a, of a woman. And second of all, it, it breasts become bigger when a woman is pregnant, by the way, uh, that this is something that is just biologically explainable that there's a relationship between fertility and breasts that is actually discernible visually when, 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 when a woman becomes pregnant and when a woman has a child and is feeding a baby. So the idea that a man would see in a breast something which would, make, which would properly make that woman into the house for his child is not something which is, which is completely bottom up explainable in terms of biology and in terms of of how animals reproduce. Now, mm -hmm. you can't like I think as a Christian, it does. It's not reduced to that. It's actually manifesting another another type of reality. But you can explain it that way if you want, and then you could you could uh, you could keep you could keep scaling up. Let's say in terms of social behaviors and why why it is that people act the way they do. You can kind of explain it, but usually it actually ends up surprisingly revealing. Um, revealing some patterns which end up being let's say true mm -hmm. and okay. even in the way that we as christians understand it yeah 
So, but, but how is it? How is a naturalist not just not explaining things bottom up? How? Why? Why can't it just be? Well, they're explaining it by looking at the bottom, and that's it. Well, that's there is no they up. Don't, they, they're they're bullshitting themselves if they think they're looking at the bottom because the bottom is the quantum field. Let's how about let's start there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Or are you going? The only reason why they start at bags of fat is like, what do you think? Of, the bag is the bottom of the reality. You think fat is the bottom of reality? It goes keeps it keeps breaking down, my friend. Keep breaking it down. So you bring it up to identities that you can that you can that are actually qualitative. You say a bag, so you say it's a container, right? Mm-hmm. And then you are relating it to something which exists. And so so you stop there and you think that you're not you're not scaling up the levels of reality. You are. Mm, fair enough. You're just gotcha. not doing it. You're not you don't keep going. It's like I let's see. just keep going now because it's not true that you're at the bottom of reality. That's a that's a you're now you're deluding yourself if you think you're at the bottom of reality. But the identity of a bag is something which we know what it is. It has a teleological purpose. It has a, it has a good, and we know what that good is. Um, so it's not. So there, there's something about about the the process which doesn't work. Got you. Uh, so, that makes sense. Yeah. So you haven't started sense. when you say bag of fat. You've started well up the chain. You're well up the ladder. <laughs> Way at up that the point. chain. <laughs> like really into human, even even into like human teleology and human purpose driven action. And so to say uh, all that there all all that exists seems to be chaos because I have no good arguments for thinking God exists. So I, I, I begin by thinking all there is is mindless matter which I give names to. Um, and yeah, you're right. I can't see the bottom because I'm not smart enough, or we haven't advanced uh, enough in order to do that. But without a compelling argument for God or whatever you mean by God, I'm just going to stick with this is all meaningless and I give names to it. And that's that's not that's not a good enough, you don't think? Well, because it first of all, you don't give names to it. Nobody, nobody gives names to things. It's you could say it's like humans give names to things. So you you even those names you receive from from your sure. ancestors, like you receive from tradition. So you receive names from from tradition. And those names are teleological. They're purpose driven. They're mm-hmm. not just descriptions of things. That's not true. Because there are certain things that we that we have, let's say, that we have names that we engage with, and there are certain things that we don't. So it's like, okay, so think of a, I don't know, you have a cardboard box, right? So we have a name for a cardboard box. But if I point to you to a part of it, I would add, what's the name of that part? Here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, in this section right here, what's the name of that? And you're like, well, that doesn't have a name. Really, it doesn't have a name. Are you saying it doesn't exist? Well, of course it exists, right? Names are teleological. So the idea that we, that we have an identity of a cardboard box means that we know what it's for. There's a reason why we right. give a name to it. And it's like that for yeah. everything. Like everything that has a name is named for reason. Like it's named out of purpose. And it's usually has to do with human uh, level interaction or human level uh, engagement that's been messed up a lot because of artificial seeing, like because of telescopes and microscopes, we've, we've, let's say, uh, convinced ourselves that we have complete access to any level of reality, but we still see that world through this lens, right? Through this frame of experience that we have. And so, you can think that, for example, the solar system is a, is a perfectly acceptable structure, but the solar system is secondary to the sun rising up in the morning and going down at night. And you know why it's secondary? Because your entire world is structured around that. Everything is structured around that reality. And so a lot of the science, a lot of the trope, a lot of the, like the tricks of science has been to move into levels of perception that are beyond our normal level of perception through mechanical means and and giving us and trying to pretend that that's the bottom of reality. Like, or that that's the, but you're still perceiving it from you. Like, so it's not the <laughs> bottom of reality. You're still there. You're a person mm. looking through a microscope and that's the first experience, not gotcha. what's down there at the, at the you know, un- underneath. Yes, yes, yes. Right? And so that that's what you can't, you can never get out of. You can't, and you can catch people. Yes. Like it's good to be to be attentive and listen to people. And all of a sudden, when they pretend that they're not in the world, ah, like they they pretend as if they don't exist. 
and you're like, wait a minute, whoa, 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 let's bring you back, my friend. Let's come back into this this this, this thing because it's like, are you a disembodied god now that you can speak this way? That you can yeah. speak as if you perceive the solar system? You don't perceive Oof. the solar system. You've never perceived the solar system. No human has ever perceived it. It's a scientific abstraction based on this experience in the world that we have that we're able to calculate and abstract from and create a model. And now we can think of that model, but you that's not first level. Like that's that's way up, like that's way up in terms of the levels of abstraction once you have something like that. Yeah, so it's like trying to detach yourself from reality and then you look at it, but you can't do that because you're part of it. Yeah, gotcha. You see it, everybody, that crit people that criticize religion are always doing that. They're constantly doing that. They pretend as if their moral system doesn't exist, that it's completely objective. You yeah. see it like Dawkins is a great example of that. He has such strong moral sense, you know, and he pretends as if his moral sense doesn't exist, right? He's, I'm just a scientist. I'm just right. a scientist suddenly getting offended at how Christians act in the world. It's like, where does that offense come from, Mr. Dawkins? Like, does it come from biology? Does your off, does your offense at what Christians did burn people? Like, do you think that scientifically it matters whether Christians burn people or didn't? Like, does that really matter? Like, a, like a lion that mm. eats a cub in the nature and in terms of just scientific processes, there's no value there. There's no there's no morality there. What are you talking about? But suddenly yeah. these weird new atheists they have this super strong moral sense, but they pretend like they don't. And now they, they they use science to criticize Christians, but they have this like invisible. They they act as if they're like disembodied gods with like moral senses. It's very fascinating if you're attentive to it. You just mm. have to ask like, where, where does your where does your morality come from? Like, where does your capacity to judge phenomena come from? If all you're saying is that you're a scientist describing phenomena, like, where does the judgment come from? How can you judge phenomena? It has to come from it has to be some, or at least you could say something like, let's analyze the manner in which you judge phenomena. And you'll see that you're participating in the same tropes, you know, that the 11th century bishop was doing when he was confessing someone, a priest in, you know, you're participating in the same pattern. You just don't know it. Mm. You're not, you're too naive. You don't realize it, but you're participating in the same type of structure. I don't know if this has anything to do with what we're talking about. I suspect it does. This desire to get rid of ritual, and, and it's coming back, as you say. I mean, even Protestant churches are reincorporating it. I was listening to John Eldridge from Wild at Heart. He had a podcast that came out the other day, and he's talking all about Advent and the candles and the hymns and things like this. It's, 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 and I'm sure he's been doing that for a while, but it's beautiful to see. Um, but you even see that like in our we don't understand why we have to get dressed up for church or we yeah. don't understand why some sort of ceremony has to take place. Like, isn't this just sort of BS? Like, like just, just, just say something in noughts and ones or something like, yeah. speak to that if you don't mind. <laughs> that's even, that's even an easier thing to deal with because once you realize that action is purposed, like the action is theological, te teleological, and that mm -hmm. action is necessarily patterned, all action must be patterned and okay. so once you realize that then you will notice <sighs> that not only is ritual meaningful ritual is inevitable because when you brush your teeth you yes. engage in a ritual you engage in ordered action with a purpose now you know like it's easier to understand when you're talking about human interactions so if i encounter someone that encounter has to be ritualized there's no way around it if mm -hmm. it's not ritualized, it will destroy the, the encounter. And so if I meet you, right, there are mm -hmm, certain yeah. things that I have to do. I have to look you in the eye. I say hello. I ask your name. I shake your hand. I speak to you, and then I wait, and you speak back, and I keep a certain distance from you. That, those, the, the actual rituals are variable, right? They can depend on time and space. But the fact that it's ritualed is yeah. inevitable. Right. Because so it's... I, it's if I start it's screaming almost... at the top of my lung, then your face, then you're, it's going to break communion. If I if I like go behind you and talk to the back of your head, it's going to destroy the communion. <laughs> there are a million things I could do yeah. to break the ritual that I'm engaging with. But it's still a ritual. Is that your it's point? It's definitely that... a ritual. There's no yeah. way around it. So it's almost so like somebody at around a table at, at dinner is ritual is a is a total ritual, completely. Yeah. 
There's no way around it. And so that scales up. And you realize that the way that you encounter, the way that you, when you drive on the street on a certain side of the road and you put your, 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 your you signal and you turn, and it, all of these things are all ritualized encounters with the world in order to make them possible. And that scales up into liturgy and, and yeah. liturgy becomes completely understandable. It, it, it so becomes when, completely coherent and inevitable. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. When somebody says, "So, so why, why do I have to go through this ritual?" So, is are you, is what you're saying is, well, you will engage in a ritual. Like you, you can't not. So, which ritual best matches reality and the way in which you wish to engage it, associate with yeah. it? Yeah. And okay. it's even, it's even, it's even more radical than that, which is that if you don't engage in deliberate rituals. What you will do is you will engage in unconscious and accidental rituals. That is, huh. addiction is religious. Addiction yeah. is ritualized behavior, and it's yeah. completely ritualized. You can so you true. can you can you can recognize the, the the steps. You can recognize the system. It it and it repeats itself over and over. And you engage in the same types of behavior, and you engage in the same steps towards your addiction, and then what happens after your addiction, this kind of despondency, and then you come back and then you, you re-engage with your addiction. And so it, addiction is a form of worship. You know, it's mm. not, it's, it, it's a form of ritualized behavior, but it's a ritualized behavior, which instead of bringing you into communion with others and making all of us turn up towards the highest good is a, is a type of ritual that is an idol and enslaves you. And makes you a slave of its pattern, hmm. Hmm. so you can't avoid it. There's no way around religious ritual. It just depends, like you said, which which rituals would you engage with? With and also, the rituals that you engage with will help you modify the other ones, right? So if you if you pray, if you if you if you go if you encounter the sacraments, it will help you. It's not a, it's not just a one on one thing, but it will help mm -hmm. you to to move away from your bad pattern. Like you have to replace bad patterns with good patterns. I got a, I got a question for you again. I always think I always I think this is all tied together. And if you need to go at any point, just hang up. No, on I'm, I'm good. I'm okay. good. <laughs> I I I uh, I've been trying for a long time now to to stop swearing, and uh, I think I I think and 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 my my listeners who are familiar with the show will forgive me for bringing this up again. But I think I've got a decent argument against swearing. But if it's not good, I want to know. And if it is good, I'd like you to help me understand it better. Would that be okay? Sure, go ahead. Because I, I do think it it ties into what we're talking about here, right? Yeah. And here it is. Um, when, uh, okay, when you observe humans, you see that when they engage in behaviors that are like unto the beasts, they ritualize them or elevate them to set that action apart or to distinguish themselves from the beasts. So uh, we defecate and urinate. We, uh, we nourish ourselves with food. We copulate, right? Um, and interestingly, it, it, most swear words are associated with those things in addition to religion. It might have to do something, I think, with the places we find ourselves the most vulnerable. I'm not sure about that, but... Um, you know, when, when humans get together to eat, they don't just eat in any kind of way. Um, I mean, you, a hot dog is something you hold in your hand, but even then, you know, there's certain rules. You know, you don't just eat like an animal. You don't do that. When you have sex, like we, we would think someone was beastly if they were having sex in the street, you know, like we, 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 we might like candles, you know, we might set the mood we, to elevate this action. Um, if you were at my house, Jonathan, and I and you saw my son just taking a dump in the backyard and saw me encouraging it like this isn't good you shouldn't do that like you shouldn't yes you have to dump but you shouldn't dump in the way animals dump right so yeah. the whole point is that there's certain like uh, rituals or things that we use to elevate those activities when we share those activities with the beasts okay uh to tear down those activities is to become more beast-like and that's not good and um the argument is that when we swear we're doing orally we're kind of tearing down those structures and rituals and elevations orally. And so that I really shouldn't be saying things like shit and ass and se and sexual things and 
because um, I, I'm, I'm, yeah. Well, you get my point. What do you think of that? Well, I think I think it's a I think it's a good beginning. I think I think that you need to be able you should be able to account for. So uh, let, let, how about this? Let me give you my my uh, theory about swearing, and Please. then tell me how it fits with yours. Let's say, um, uh -huh. and so the the there's a in in our world we have the public sphere. Like it's similar to what you're saying. Like there's a world of the public which is reasonable and which is coherent, right? And it's communal. Okay, and so. Then from that world, there are things that are set apart again, exactly the way that you're talking about. Okay. And so there are things that are set apart from the communion. Some things are set apart above as being sacred. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's because they are beyond the communion and they also, but they bind the communion together. Okay. And there mm -hmm. are some things which are set aside below, you could say, and they are the scandals. Right, the, the things that will break down our communion out of a scandal, let's say. Okay, and so there's two types of hiddenness. You could say that uh, there's a the world is is hidden in garments of skin. Right, in after the fall, we are we are covered in garments of skin, and there's two types of nakedness. There's the nakedness of glory, you could say, in the garden, and then there's the nakedness of shame at the bottom. Which is the nakedness uh, of the you know Noah drunk in his tent, you could say. Mm -hmm. So if you think think of the story of uh, of Genesis as starting as naked in the garden and ending as naked in your tent in a in a in a drunken manner that you need to be covered. Okay, so those are the two extremes, let's say, of setting aside. Now, what happens when we swear is we are trying to express something which is outside of the system of meaning. Because this part in the middle is the coherent communal system of meaning. But sometimes we have experiences, uh, which is violence or like when you stub your toe or you get super angry and you don't find a word within the system of meaning to express what you're dealing with. So what you'll do is you'll, you will go into the cast out, like into the cast away and bring it into the system of meaning to express the disjunction. So you're basically expressing disjunction. You're expressing like, th this makes no sense. I can't, I can't express it. And so I need to go into the hidden part. I need to bring out the hidden part into public to express the disjunction. So that's why it's all fecal, it's all sexual, it's all that. Now, what we do when we use religious words is, is that we're confusing the top and the bottom. We're confusing the sacred with the with the with the out, the dark outside, and we're tr we're taking religious things and we're pulling them into the the this this darker aspect, but they're related. That's why both of them tend to be used in swearing, because we we tend we want to reach outside of the of the system of meaning, in order to to express something which is beyond expression. So we'll reach up and we'll reach down and we'll mix them together. And so we create this, this thing. Um, but what it does, I mean, obviously the reason why we shouldn't swear, is especially not use the religious words, is exactly because we're desacralizing. We're, we're participating in, in, in desacralization when we're doing that. We're, we're basically taking pearls and throwing them in the mud. We're taking the highest thing and we're confounding it with the lowest thing. Okay. And so that's why we shouldn't do that. Um, the reason why it's it's a dangerous thing to bring out the the bottom things up is also because that this stuff at the bottom, right? This all the dark stuff. If you bring it into public, like you said, it's destroying the world. Like it literally will destroy the world. Like if you shit in, like if you take a crap on the on the kitchen table, you will destroy your reality. Your reality <laughs> will not hold together if you start doing things like that. And so as you do it orally, like what you said, you br you're bringing this chaos. You're kind of like you're basically like pulling this chaos up into the world and you're kind of participating in its destructuring. But now the most ah. mysterious thing, the craziest ah. thing, this is the thing that will, that, that will blow your mind is that Jesus Christ manifests those two at the same time, all the yeah. time. He's constantly yeah. doing that, but he does it in a way that doesn't destroy the world. He's basically reaching up and down 
at the same time. And so he, he, he's humiliated, he's beaten, he's treated like a criminal, he goes down into the bottom of death, but he's at the same time, Ooh. he's the king, he's the holy, in the holy of holies, he's, he's up in the secret place in the, in the holy temple. So when he dies, he goes down outside of the world, that down, and into the holy of holies at the same time, which is just crazy. So Christ, like Christ smashes it all, like if you want to understand, but at least in our world, like in, in our world, you really definitely want to be careful because when you swear from above, you're just, you're, you're both way, in both ways, you're just, you're participating in destroying the world or destructuring the world. But at least we can understand why that happens. Oh, it's not arbitrary at all. That is so powerful. I'm going to think about that for the next three weeks. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Now, no worries but friend. when when we use sexual language, aren't we in a sense bringing the higher thing down also? Because we're degrading th this sacred act. No, because think about it: the word, the sexual words we use are never the proper words. They're always the dirty versions. Mm. Of yeah, the that's word. right. Yeah. We don't say "oh, copulate." Like we don't say that, right? <laughs> we say we use Semen. the bad word, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. We use the we use the dark kind of illegitimate words in order to bring that. So we're always reaching down when we're doing that. We're kind of going into the dirty part of sexuality and wanting to manifest it in, in the world. But in so doing, we're, we're degrading the beauty of the sexual oh, sure. act. Of course, yeah. we are. Yeah, definitely. But I yeah. see what you mean. You, you, you are, yeah, you're reaching down into the bottom. And wow, that's really interesting. And then what's kind of sad is when you become the sort of person that doesn't doesn't even consciously drag things from the bottom up. You're just, uh, it's just part of your language is you're blaspheming and speaking. But think closely. about people who swear all the time. Yeah, I'm thinking like, of them. If you, if you know some people like that, you'll realize yeah. that it's, it's, it's actually, it manifests a general pattern. Oh, it manifests a disjunction. It, it, yeah, it, it doesn't it? Like it's, a, it's, it, it's, it's prophetic it's, of their own. Exactly, of their own state, of their own spiritual state, of their own, the wow. way that they encounter the world, the way God. that also they might be someone who, let's say, tends to damage relationships, tends to not be careful oh. of others, tends to, you know, all of that will be part of why oh someone will be completely lost to, to swearing. It's, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that with me. Hey, uh, we got a super chat. I need to read it before, because they right, were so kind. It. Kind. Uh, Ricardo says, greetings from Panama. Thank you both for your awesome work. It has helped me a lot. Do you have any suggestions regarding helping one's loved ones understand the darker times that seem to be coming? <laughs> I, I guess that I guess they're talking about, you know, the, 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 I don't know, the demise of Western civilization and yeah. The end times. I, don't think, like this. I think that it's I think that if you if you attend too much to that, like if you're too careful about that, you might not be focusing on the right thing. You know, I think that it's best for for each of us to find our own truth, let's say, like find the truth in this situation that is know how you're going to live it out as a authentic Christian, how you're going to be faithful to your faith within these kind of chaotic times. Um mm -hmm and live as an example. And of course you can, you can try to communicate to that, to be that to people around you. But if you're worried too much about that, like if you're worried that nobody believes you or that nobody understands what you're saying and that I'm trying to help them understand what's going on, but nobody understands and it's freaking you out, then maybe you're not focusing on the right things at the moment. You know, it's better yeah. to, to, to live your own life in the best way you can. Um, Jonathan, when we have uh, this, uh, I don't know, your traveling restrictions ended, I, I, I would just love to get together with you one day, mate. I'd love to have you in the studio. Um, I know that's a sacrifice to have to come down here, but gosh, I, I really so enjoy listening to you. And you seem to be such a blessing to people. People are saying all sorts of uh, lovely things about you, saying that you've really illumined them, have, have led them to Christianity. Um, you know, so thank you. I'm glad you exist, brother. Oh, we just say glory to God, I guess, is the best thing to say. Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, we have another super chat here. Um, can you ask Jonathan whether it's ever okay to use artificial contraception and how he feels about <laughs> Orthodox priests? Okay, so I didn't yeah. realize how loaded this question was when I threw it no, on the screen. No, that's fine. So. I, I'm fine with answering that question. I would yeah. say that in I think I think in general, using artificial contraception is not acceptable. Um but I think that in the in the Orthodox tradition, we we priests are have the capacity to adjust 
you know, ideals to people's certain circumstances. So sometimes if there are health issues, if there are, uh, you know, if it's dangerous for people to say to get pregnant for this or that reason or for whatever, then I would leave that up to the priest to decide to what extent they are willing to be uh, flexible. But for sure, I think ideally in the Orthodox tradition, artificial contraception is not is not acceptable. Uh, I just have to, I know you understand the Catholic position, but for those who don't, yeah. the Catholic position would be that it is like it's a it's a contradiction of the meaning of the sexual act and for that reason is never acceptable. Uh, and, a, and the Catholic priest wouldn't have the authority to uh, permit somebody to engage in that. You're welcome yeah. to push back. No, I, I don't want to push back. I think that it's yeah. it's, the, it's the same. It's like in terms of uh, an Orthodox priest, the way an Orthodox priest would see your spiritual life would be as a, a, a like you're, you're a sick person that needs to be healed. And there are different emphases that we need to put on different things at different times in order to bring you to that healing. And so sometimes it's best to emphasize certain things and de-emphasize others in order to not make you crack. Right. And, you know, it's like if I if I have an ideal for you, but it's like I can't just lay it out all on you at the same time because you're not right. going to make it. And I know you're not going to make it. And so it's like, OK, let's moderate this and not not negate the ideal. Right. Because the purpose is to bring us into communion with God. And so it's like, let's slowly bring you up. And so that's usually the way a lot of Orthodox priests will, will, will uh, uh, let's say, deal with that. Because it's, there's a lot of stuff in Orthodoxy, like there's a lot. Like if you go, if you take the ideal, like you should be fasting all these days and all these months of the year. And, you know, you should be saying, like you should, you should have like a, like a half an hour preparation service or more before you go to communion and you should confess every time you go to communion and you should, it's like the ideal is super high, right? Yeah. It's not just about one thing. And so usually what clergy will do is, is try to say, okay, what can you handle at this time and try to apply that to your life so that we move towards the, the ideal. So, but that's so how, the way it's treated. Like genuine question here, like somebody comes to confession and they're looking at pornography every day, right? Um, because I understand what you're saying, right? This this kind of law of gradualness. Like we're not saying that the law changes. Like there is things that are right and there are things that are wrong. Mm. But sometimes we seem to be incapable of always choosing the good, especially if we're addicted to something. But I presume, and this isn't a gotcha question, but I presume a priest wouldn't in the Orthodox communion wouldn't say, well, I mean, try to maybe just scale back your pornography use. I don't know. I don't know how. Yeah. Would, I'm not a priest. I don't know how the priest would would uh, would do it. Like there's some, there are probably different ways to approach that. Some priests might actually do something like say, look, like especially if someone's super addicted to something, might say something like, okay, look, let's not deal with your addiction right now. How about if we work on your prayer life instead to start with? Sure. Let's sure. get you started. Let's have you do your daily prayers. Let's have you do the Jesus prayer, let's say, for a certain amount of time a day. Um, and then once that's, let's say, set up, then we could attack the the sin, for example, because mm -hmm. just stopping d to do something usually doesn't work. Yeah, like no, you, I, I If agree. you just stop doing something, it's not it's like you leave a vacuum in your soul that needs to be filled with other things. And so I don't know, like I'm not a priest, but I, I'm saying that I'm giving an example of up, like I, that I could imagine a priest telling someone, you know, it's like, yes, what you're doing is wrong and immoral and dangerous, but let's focus on this to give you the possibility of moving away from this. I, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make a comparison to, between two particular sins. And I, yeah. and I, so that's what I'm saying. So, so, okay. So the Orthodox but priest if, like, might... if someone was, I don't know, like if, if there are certain sins also that have more social consequences. So it's like, sure. obviously if someone was beating their child and then they came to the priest, the priest wouldn't say <laughs> necessarily, well, like, keep beating your child and, you know, uh, we'll do this. It's like they might be a little more extreme in the measures they put, but I think it just depends also on, it's not a, yeah. it's not, it's not something which has a, just is a rule, let's say. Although there are canons, like there are definitely canons, that's for sure. Okay. Uh, we have two more super chats, and then we, we won't take any more. So for those who are in the in in the um, chat right now, because uh, I don't want them to have to be a super chat, and then we not get to the question. But here's one: uh, Hey, I hope you are you all are okay. It's awesome to have Jonathan. I don't know if you could ask him what does he think about the meaning of death in the universe, or, or of the death of the universe. Oh, I apologize. Yes, you're exactly <laughs> right. Meaning of the, of the death universe. of the universe. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, 
I would say that it's probably uh, it's probably best not to not to worry about that. It's probably better to worry about your own death because that's for sure going to happen. You're going to die. So it, there's a lot of these these types of speculative or very large large questions, which I which I don't think are completely uh, that there may be a little more of a distraction. But if mm. you if you want to think of it, the idea that that all created things are not eternal. Like if you want to understand it that way, it's a good way to understand it. The only eternal uh, self-contained thing is God and not thing, but you know, the only self-contained reality is that of God and all the others are limited in their scope and in their existence. And so the idea that the universe, that the physical universe has a, will not last forever. It's, it's not something that should surprise a Christian. You know, I've often thought people like to think about when is the end times going to happen? And the fact is, kind of as you say, like there will be an end time for you sooner, maybe, than later. And and like when when might that be, right? Like suppose I'm fairly confident that in 40 years I'll be dead. Okay, so now what if I knew for a fact the second coming was going to happen in 40 years? All right, like how how would I live? Well, I should probably kind of live like that. I mean, there's an analogy there, you know, like yeah, because the end's your death you. is equivalent to the second coming in yeah. terms of your experience. That is, that's that's <laughs> it. Like when you die, that's pretty much the second coming for you. <laughs> yeah. All right. Here's the here's the last question here. Hi, Jonathan. You travel in a spaceship to a parallel universe and reach Earth while God created Eve. Eve hasn't yet eaten the apple. How do you explain Eve? To or Eve. maybe to Eve? Yeah, not to eat the apple. This is nice. What I a do. cool question, dude. <laughs> I mean, I, oh, man, this is going to sound really bad, but I probably wouldn't. Oh, like as if yeah. as if as if as if God's word wasn't su wasn't sufficient for Eve to make the right choice. God mm -hmm. told Adam and Eve, and so it's not like I'm going to drop in there and I'm going to uh, say something which will be beyond what God has told Adam and Eve. And so I think that, you know, uh, yeah, at some point, at that point, I don't think that I would have a say in what's going on. It's probably yeah. the best way to understand that's, it. So I probably yes, would just watch. Good. I'm sorry to say, I probably would just yeah. watch and not say anything. Yeah. Hey, uh, just so those, um, I want to show them this again. Um, for those who are just joining the live stream, Jonathan is putting together this graphic novel. Uh, and you can see it on your screen right now. There's a link in the description below. Uh, I'm actually, as soon as we're done here, I'm going to get on and, and donate to this because I want it to happen. And I want this sort of content for my children. And it's important that we support the sort of content we wish to exist. So if people are out there right now and you think this looks worth, um, you know, supporting, please, please do it. Any, anything else you want to say? Uh, before no, I, I think that, like I said, maybe at the outset, I feel like there. this is an interesting moment in terms of Christian arts. I'm getting a lot of artists writing me, getting all these emails of people converting to Christianity, becoming usually either orthodox or catholic more in the like a little more traditional catholic um mm -hmm. and a lot of artists filmmakers illustrators you know people who work on in, in for big uh, studio movies um there's a, i think there's a an awakening in a lot of the artistic community that we need better stories and we need it now and we need yeah. better images and we need them now and so hopefully we're playing our little part with this graphic novel and kind of putting some seeds into some positive seeds into the world. So so we appreciate all the support people can can bring to it. Yeah. All right, Jonathan, thanks so much for being on the show. Thanks to everybody who's been watching in the live stream and who will watch later. God bless you. Uh, thanks. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it.